to introduce our guest for today, all the way from Silicon Valley. He is the founder of Upship Partners. He advises companies like Uber, Thumbtack, and a lot of other great Silicon Valley startups. He bootstrapped his company from zero to $25 million. So he is a master of scale. Please, I'd like to invite you to get up on your feet and Stand up, please, <laughs> and give a warm round of applause and welcome to the Luna of the Century. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Just Gabe. Oh man, so happy. I don't think that's on. Test, test, one, two. Very good. Welcome yeah, to so happy to be here. First time in Africa, and uh, I think I'll be back soon. Excellent. Yeah. Did it turn out to be the way you thought it would be? No, it's fantastic. Yeah, okay. we're, we went on, went, we're in uh, Zambia, I was telling you. Yeah. You're from Zambia. Yeah. So we're in Zambia this morning, and Zimbabwe, and Botswana, and Cape Town. So. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. They, they need to start getting like direct flights from Silicon Valley to Silicon Cape. I think we need that. <laughs> <laughs> That's really excellent. Yeah. And, um, so I'd like to just we start learning about your background, where you grew up, and notice that we have a lot in common, Gabe. Like we grew up without TVs, without electricity, <laughs> electricity and you grew up around farmers. Only that your kind of farmers are California type farmers. <laughs> Could you tell us about your background? Yeah, so I was born in Northern California. Uh, I was raised by hippie parents on a hippie commune uh, up in Northern California, a few hours north of San Francisco. So my, my path to getting into tech was not a direct route, let's say that. Um, you know, the, the only entrepreneurs that I knew grew marijuana up in, <laughs> up in Northern California. They were all farmers. They were way ahead of time, right? <laughs> now we're only getting to see the benefits of Early adopters, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, didn't go to, I didn't go to, you know, Ivy League school. I, in fact, I dropped out of college. Both my parents were in entrepreneurs. One was an artist, and one was uh, worked in nonprofits. So, you know, my path to being in Silicon Valley tech was not a was not a direct one. Um, and it, it was an interesting path, I guess. I started a business when I was in college, which was a, is a kind of brick and mortar business. It was, a, it was a house painting company, and so the way I paid my way through school was painting houses. Um, and then I realized. I don't think I want to be in the house painting business. Um, and the hardest part was getting leads for us. And so what we did is we decided, hey, what if instead of painting houses, we just got leads for other types of contractors? And, and so it was a pretty simple idea, solving a pretty simple problem. And, uh, and we started it in, in a spare bedroom with just me and a business partner. Uh, at the time, we had one computer that we shared. And, uh, and the way in which we got leads for other contractors was we, we actually went around and literally knocked on doors. And we would write people's names down in yellow pads. Yeah. We would take them back. And then we had someone on our team that would type them on the computer and then print them out. And we would send a fax to the contractors with the names. And then they would send us a check. So like, this is the minimum viable product, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and, and honestly, we, we did that like very, very simple, super rough thing to like probably a million dollars in revenue. Uh, and then we discovered this thing called the internet, which was transformative to the business. And we realized that we didn't have to knock on doors anymore. There was this thing called Google, and yeah. people knocked on the door every single day. Uh, and so, yeah, so we, we started continuing to build the business, went through a lot of iterations. I mean, there's four or five times in that business that we were probably a week or two away from total bankruptcy. Yeah, and it is that business of mine. Yes, that's right. So, so built that business, I made a lot of mistakes. That's probably where I cut my teeth. Like, it was not a direct path, right? Went through, uh, you know, many executives, many times of, of near failure. And fortunately, kind of came out the other side, having learned a lot and also building a, a pretty big business. Um, so I'm still on the board of it. I stepped back about four years ago. Um, I was relaxing for about two weeks, and then my wife was like, you're annoying me. <laughs> like, you have too much horsepower. Go do something. 
go, help, go help someone. And, uh, and so the first company I helped is a company called Thumbtack, uh, which grew to be a pretty large business, continuing to grow. And then one thing led to another. I started helping other companies uh, in Silicon Valley, Uber and Lending Home, and in over three years did 35 companies, um, and then built a venture capital firm investing in those companies as well. Uh, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so the path to getting there was, was not one that I could have planned. If you asked me in college what I wanted to do, I wanted to go and work on a, on a sailboat in the Caribbean. Um, but here I am now. Let's see. And then when you started working, first of all, I'll take you back to the company. I'm interested to learn how you scaled that from zero. And you, I was from the YouTube videos you were talking about focus, and you talking about. Uh, letting the data help with the decision, yeah. and uh, also looking at the like working with numbers. But, but could you tell us some of that, like the process that you took for that? Yeah. So first, I think that um, I think that constraints are actually a really powerful thing for entrepreneurs. Um, design constraints, financial constraints. What these things do is make you you think about what is the best use of energy and best use of time and the best use of money. And when you have infinite resources, oftentimes like nothing gets done. And so in some ways, uh, we were very fortunate in the fact that we didn't have a bunch of resources. And so what it, it made us do is be very, very sharp around what we decided to put energy towards or uh, or you know, what, what, what people we hired or, or, you know, any initiatives that we had, we had to be laser focused on the things that would produce the most impact in the shortest period of time. And I'm actually really grateful for that experience because after doing that, now I go around to these companies in Silicon Valley and they've raised, you know, more, more money than they could ever spend. But in, in many cases, they're like, they can't get the engines turning because they don't have that kind of focus. Um, and so without getting like so deep into the tactics, what, I guess what we found is that by constantly asking ourselves the question is, we, we ask the question is, are these impact factors or optimization factors? And what the difference is, is, is at any given time in a business, you can do 100 different things. Um, but there's probably a couple things that would have an inordinate amount of results if you focused all of your energy on those things. So I'm a big fan of like, rather than try to do 100 things, I want to do three things with like, you know, 20 times the intensity. Um, so that, I think that's what we learned out of, out of constraints was how to focus energy and how to like focus everything on the things that matter the most. And then what are the ways in which companies at any point could use data and also to, to structure themselves for that, like in order to use data? Yeah, so I think that um, I think being an entrepreneur or working in a startup uh, is really a process of of creating hypotheses. We have, we all have opinions, right? <laughs> no shortage of opinions in this room or outside of this room. Um, the, the difference is that you know now now you have all this technology that can enable you to test and validate those opinions. So I, I kind of take the approach in startups that I, I you know I think I have some experience, I have some good ideas, but I actually don't know anything. Like, I let the tests and, and the data speak for itself, meaning rather than it being me sitting in the room saying, I have all the ideas, I have the answers to how this should go, I have, I have some ideas around it, but I'm going to let the data tell me whether those ideas are good ideas or bad ideas. And so I think that there's, there's kind of a, a culture that needs to be in startup, which is that there's no precious ideas. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, you're right, like, I completely agree you say that. You, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the facts are the same. And then also that people call their ideas babies. This is my baby. Yeah. Which makes it so difficult to kill a baby. Yeah. Kill an idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As well as doing your experiments. Like, these yeah. are what these are to test. And then, so when you're working with companies like Uber, for instance, like, what, do you, what would you look at? Or what? There are a lot of companies here that are starting out like that. Like, so you mentioned that you would say of all these things, which are the impact type activities that we focus on, what else would you do if we were to increase the acquisition? Yeah, so there's this really interesting thing that happens um, when you're starting a company. 
And when you're starting a company, you're kind of like shaping something out of clay. Like you're, you're not even sure if there's a there there. You're not even sure that this thing's going to work. You have this idea, and you're trying to shape it. And and in the beginning, it's interesting because what's valuable is, is actually like anyone that wants to talk to you and anyone that wants to give your company money is like a good customer. <laughs> and that's the nature of like an early stage thing. You're just trying to put it out there in the world and see the response that you get and see if that response is positive. And then there's this really interesting thing that happens, which is kind of counterintuitive, which is like the things that you did to just like put your ideas out there in the world, um, you start to have to get a little bit more narrow in your focus. In order to be able to accelerate, you actually have to get more focused. And that part's not intuitive. People think that like what they did to get it started is the same thing they have to do to grow it, which basically means like if you have 10 balls that you're pushing uphill, you need to like push all those 10 balls uphill at the same time. It's just, it's not possible. You need to pick which of the things you're gonna focus on and, and focus all of your energy on those things. So I find that, I'll give you a good example. Is that like in the beginning, you might have all different types of customers, right? And, and, and when I ask, the, I always ask this of startups, it's like, okay, who's your customer? Like describe them exactly. Tell me all the attributes of your customers. And, and most people say like, well, everyone's our customer. Like, you know, anyone's their customer. And, and they haven't taken the time to really understand the, the exact attributes that make their customer. So, so rather than them try to go out and get 10,000 more customers, what I've found is like, if they focused all of their energy on their best customers, they could get a fraction of them and grow the business five times as fast. And that's what constraints taught me, was like we couldn't just go and spend more or hire more people. We had to continually focus on the core and what, was, what would have produced the most impact. So hopefully that's a good answer for that. And we'll start taking questions from the audience. So think about your questions in the meantime. And then when you're looking now to, to invest, You've invested in lots of companies. What do you look for specifically in the, in the companies that you invest? Yeah, so there's, there's, just, there's always like a, a friendly argument around people say, like, oh, you invest in the team or you invest in the market. Yes. Um, this is always a, a constant discussion. My, my personal opinion is that they're both important. Uh, but if you take a great team and you put them in a crappy market, they're always going to toil. And if you take a great market and you take an average team, they will still succeed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big fan. Of, it's not saying that I will take a, a, you know, a great market with a terrible team, but I, would, I will always pick market over team. Okay. So that's, probably count, that's probably not what a lot of Silicon Valley investors would say. But. Because, yeah, that's the, another image, because there's usually idea or team, but you talked about markets, which is... Critical. Well, wow. and then for the markets, what do you look for to say this is a good market? Yeah. So it again, some of this is um, very specific to like venture-funded startups in Silicon Valley, which I think there's a lot of amazing businesses to be built that are not like there's a very very small percentage of businesses in the world that are truly venture like venture scale businesses, mm -hmm. and it's not a good. It's not like that's a good formula for everyone. Like I actually personally believe that the best formula for most people is build a business that makes money and that gives you the freedom to be able to do whatever you want in the world. Um, to be able to hire the people you want, to be able to go on the vacations that you want, like to create that freedom for yourself. Um, when people go down this like venture funded track, it, it, it's basically like taking a, like a, a, bi a kind of a broken down bicycle and strapping a rocket engine to it. Like the, the, the chances of failure are very, very high. Um, like, you know, like 1% of the companies that get funded in Silicon Valley turn out to be billion dollar companies. Like people don't appreciate that. And, and it typically takes 10 to 15 years. So what that means is that when, when somebody raises money from venture capitalists, like you, it's not like something to celebrate. You, you get a loan. <laughs> and then you have to go and build this company. You really don't make any money for that period of time. And so you have to just, you have to, to be so crazy passionate about spending the next 10 to 15 years of your life potentially not making any money and then, and then having the business fail. And that's the part that people don't talk about. I think that it, people create this allure around, oh, well, everyone should go out and raise venture capital for their businesses. And the reality is most people should not. 
Like they should be able to find customers that pay for the service and build the business off of revenue. Um, and then, you know, then, you know, capital is used typically for very high risk, very high reward things that are $10 billion opportunities. Um, so I think that's kind of a long answer to that question, but I, I'm personally like I bootstrap my first company, bootstrap my second company. I, I am involved in this world now, but I would say most businesses should just be trying to focus on, on generating revenue that would support the growth of their businesses. Mm -hmm. Well, you said like a lot of things that I feel like would be playing like short clips of what you said. That needs to be heard here because a lot of times people say, I need money, I need VCs, I need this, I need that. And then for the most part, to be, when I'm coaching people, like, what do you need the money for? And they haven't thought about yeah. <laughs> what they need the money for. And then all, most of the time, like, raising money in itself is used as a metric goal of success. Yeah, it's, you know, like, it's, oh, not, something, it's, yeah, it's not something you celebrate. Yeah. Like, people have, like, a party to celebrate that they got a loan. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I don't understand why you're celebrating. <laughs> 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 and then, what type of opportunities do you think exist in Africa, what type of things should we be thinking about with the more penetration now and then with the powers that we have right now accessible to us? When with your experience coming in, looking at what you're seeing here, what do you see that we don't see, that you help us see? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I know the market that well to be able to, to advise you on your own market. You guys know that this economy way better than I could ever imagine. Um, what I would say is that around the world, like I, I go and try to do this everywhere that I go, um, and there's this, there's this attraction to Silicon Valley for good reason that everyone wants to kind of make the new Silicon Valley. And it's like, there is no other new Silicon Valley. Like it, it just is, it's a separate thing. But you have something different and very, very valuable here, which we don't have, right? Like you have, you have different problems, you have different technical expertise, you have a different legal environment. You have different accesses to funding. You have different natural resources. Like, you have different education programs here. And so, rather than try to like play somebody else's playbook, like play your own playbook. Like play to your advantages. Play to what are what are the unique opportunities that can be built here. Not try to copy the things that are in Silicon Valley, uh, because there's a whole different set of things that make Silicon Valley Silicon Valley which you don't have here. And so it would be foolish to try to play by that exact playbook. Brilliant. Can we give you citizenship, you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> Direct flights. Direct flights. <laughs> Direct flights, yeah, we need to lower the airport taxes. Still, yeah. we struggle with that. Like, intra-Africa travel is super expensive. Yeah. Like, from Zambia to here, it costs the same to go to Stockholm, yeah. to, go to France, you know? But, and then, uh, when it comes to well, look, what are the things that you're working on now, like the future, yours? What are you thinking about when you're working on? Yeah, you know, there's some things that I think are really interesting that are kind of emerging spaces. Um, you know, one of them that I find really interesting, I, I've done a bunch of marketplaces, so that's kind of an area that I, I get really interested in, um, is how to bring together fragmented bases, right? You have lots of people that want to reach each other, and, that, and marketplaces have proven to be able to bring those people together, right? Bring drivers together with riders or, or bring together people that want to get loans from people that want to lend money. Um, and so, so if you think about that, I think what we saw in the early days of marketplaces was you saw people transacting goods, right? Like the eBay days where you're, where you're transacting goods, right? E-commerce marketplaces. And then you started to see some, some other marketplaces that were like, you know, let's call them like, uh, you know, these kind of services marketplace, Airbnb, etc. And I, I think something that will start to happen and next, which I think is actually gives me a lot of promise around the future of work. I have a long, a big thesis around kind of future of work is that there's going to be platforms that are going to facilitate people around the world to be able to use their mobile device and, and provide all different sorts of services to other people that are all around the world. And we haven't really seen that fully get baked yet. Where you, where you have educated populations around the world that can now plug into global, global employer pools. And I actually think that that will act, gives me a lot of promise for when people talk about the doom and gloom around AI taking away everyone's jobs. Like I actually just think there's gonna be a bunch of new jobs that are going to emerge with the advent of mobile technology and the advent of new problems that we can't even see right now. Mm. Let's see, great. 
Uh, can we have a third microphone for questions? And what mindset do leaders need to have if you want to scale and want to grow your business from uh, whatever size it was, now you want to 10x it, whatever, or you want to grow by whatever factor? Is there certain things that leaders need to think about or to unlearn? I think you alluded a little bit to that earlier. Yeah, I would say that one of them is, is an approach to constant learning in the sense that the, the challenge with businesses and startups is that there's always like a changing ground under you, right? changing customers, changing environment. And so you have to have an approach where, where you're constantly open to that change. You're welcoming the change versus thinking that you're a static thing in a changing world. Um, and so as a leader of a company, you have to take the approach that you are changing as well as everything else is changing and you need to evolve yourself in order to continue to evolve the business. Mm. That's, that's one thing. I, I think the second one is this mixture of, um, I would say, confidence, like the kind of unwavering confidence in your view, um, but also an openness to new ideas. So it's a, it's a really tricky balance um, where you where when you start a business it's it's many times it's you it's your expression of creativity in the world um, and so you have to have this unwavering unwavering confidence in what you're doing otherwise you wouldn't be able to do it but also you have to be open to new ideas and new ways of doing things and that's this kind of tricky balancing act where they both have to coexist and so when you see people that have this ultra confidence but they can't let in new ideas. It doesn't end well. Mm -hmm. um, and when you see people that will be shaken by the wind um, mm -hmm. and, and don't have that kind of confidence, you know, frankly, they, they just end up kind of getting swayed by the wind in every single direction. They can't stay the path. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, questions? Is a question. Thanks, Jake. Uh, well, thanks for being here. Um, I'm curious about entrepreneurship, which is about disruptive technologies, and we see cryptocurrencies coming in as quite a significant disruptive technology, and of course we've seen cryptocurrencies almost go to the reverse of what we were expecting it to go to. So I'm curious about the opportunities that we, we see. Um, I know there's quite a lot of initiative, especially in, uh, we, we've seen it at uh, Stellenbosch University, we've seen it in a lot of startups, that they started to have a look at that shared ledger and the blockchain and everything else. So that's quite exciting to see. And I'm curious about what you've been seeing in Silicon Valley regarding the, the blockchain, but specifically I'm looking at, at cryptocurrencies and about how um, the banks kind of and the, the stage of financial institutions uh, view the cryptocurrencies. Is it alternative? Is it parallel? Is it um, competition? So that's kind of really where I'm, I'm going with it. Cool. So just kind of my perspective on the space. Is that kind of what you're asking for? Um, so I think I'll, I'll give my perspective as both like an investor and as an entrepreneur. Um, I think they're, they're linked and, and also somewhat different. When, when, when I invested in Bitcoin a while back, um, it was, I honestly didn't even know what I was investing in. Like, I don't think I really truly grasped it, and, and no one at the time really understood it. There was no talk of blockchain at the time. It was just like Bitcoin is digital currency. Um, and then as those, as those things started to emerge as an investor, I understood that, that like money is the biggest market in the world. Um, and so the potential of startups disrupting money um, is potentially the biggest startup market in the world. Um, so... But, but as an entrepreneur, the, the currency use case wasn't that interesting for me. Um, what is interesting for me was, was this new computing platform. Like when, when the emergence of, of things like Ethereum started to happen, it was very different than a currency use case. It, what it enabled entrepreneurs to do was build new things that you couldn't have built before. So it became this kind of new white space for entrepreneurs to, to experiment in, right? Like what could you build that that would enable people to transact with other people around the world that they didn't know or didn't trust? And what could you do if you could program, instead of having centralized third parties serve as like the arbiter, you could have that written into code. So if you could program both ideas and you could program money, that opens up a, a really wide white space for, for you know, smart people and smart teams to be able to, to play in. 
Um, I think that the I think that as with anything, like this happened with AI, this happened with early like web web you know 2.0, like everything gets hyped, and that's actually a good thing, because what it does is it draws in capital and it draws in talent um, into a space, into a nascent space, um, and and we've seen this in in all those other categories. It's just it always that hype cycle is just the first part. It's just the first stage. So everyone gets really excited, money, teams, everything flows in, and then everyone realizes that like, it's just not there yet. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be there. It's not a lie. It's just that the hype is just the first part in the cycle. So I think we're in day zero on this stuff. Like, I, I don't think that anyone is, like, this stuff could go down by 95%, and the level of development activity is not slowing at all. So that, that is like this thing that gives me a lot of promise for the space. Um, and I, I, yeah, so th that, would be, that would be my answer there. I, I think that banks are taking a wait and see approach with it. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that's where it's at now. Thanks. Yeah? Thanks. <laughs> okay, Will. Um, so I, I've, I've got two questions. Um, the one is unit economics. So when you've got a startup and you're speaking to VCs, they always ask you on your cap. And those type of things. Um, but then, as a startup, how do you how do you give them a cap figure about like knowing, like having the history of the data behind it? And then the second part is like with marketplaces, you get you, you have like these network effects. And I keep telling you, if you don't raise funding, you'll miss the boat. But it's always it's always like that. So, what what is your thoughts on that? Like raising funding uh, and not losing the network effects of it. Uh, so I'm, I learned today that apparently we're not supposed to say CAC here. Yeah. CAC. <laughs> CAC. Yeah. And for those of you that, that don't know, it's like cost of, cost of acquiring customer. It's just an acronym for that. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so your first question was really – there's – I'll just make sure that everyone understands. Like, so these are just acronyms, and sometimes acronyms can get a little out of hand. And it's like a you know, it's like wine language where people use these acronyms to make themselves feel comfortable. But at the end of the day, it's a pretty simple concept, right? Like, how much does it cost you to get a customer? Costs you whatever, a hundred bucks. You have to know how much that customer is worth, right? And the ratio between those things determines how much money do you spend and how much money do you lose, and and that determines whether you go out of business or stay in business. So it's, a, it's actually a pretty straightforward metric, right? Um, if you spend a dollar and you make a dollar, bad business. <laughs> if you spend a dollar and make two dollars, eh, okay business, but you probably have some overhead and other things that are not related to getting a customer, so probably still not good. So there's kind of these ratios, they call them magic ratios, which is like, you know, clearly the greater the ratio, the better. Um, but like a five to one ratio is great. You spend a dollar, you make five dollars. Like, come and tell me and, and like, People want to give you money uh, because you have a good model there. So I, I just think that the early days of a startup, I I personally like when I'm investing at the seed round of companies, like those numbers they're they're not real. They're not like just an idea that you have. You might have a few numbers, um, and and what I want to understand is more your thought process and and understand what you've learned and and how you're thinking about how those things are going to emerge like do you have a good logic and good sound reasoning it's just too early for you to have fully baked numbers um, at least that's the that's the way it is in, in silicon valley is that people are more investing kind of in the market and the team when you start to get to series a and b and beyond then it's very much a you know an, an analysis of your numbers but in the early days it's it's more around the analysis of your your thought process and your team and the market you're going after your second question is around marketplaces. So there's this kind of catch-22 with marketplaces. So if you look at like these dominant business models in the last 20 years, they are typically networks and marketplaces with proprietary network effects, um, meaning that every new person that joins the network makes the network increasingly valuable. And that becomes very, very difficult to disrupt. Um, so you look at Airbnb, you look at Facebook, you look at Amazon, um, you, know, you look at Uber, you look at Lyft, Salesforce even. Um, there's lots and lots of examples of these things. Um, so it's very clear that these businesses are super, super valuable. 
Um, but 90% of them die in what we call the bootstrap phase, which is basically the, the phase before there's real, there's enough people on both sides to make it profitable. Um, and so that's, I think, one area where, where venture capital has been really helpful is to be able to like be investing for the five-year future or the 10-year future of this idea. Um, and so in some cases, when those marketplaces are attacking very large, very fragmented markets, that's a use case for venture capital. Um, but oftentimes you can prove these things on a small scale, like on a small cohort. You can prove a marketplace like, uh, you know, some types of them. I mean, we built our marketplace literally in one city, like just to prove it. And then we went to another city and we went to another city. Not, not all marketplaces can be done that way. Um, but I think that people oftentimes can prove concepts with pretty sim simple amount of, of people and time and resources. And so I'm always a big fan of scrappy teams that are able to prove things even on a small scale and then want to raise money before, versus like, hey, I've got this idea for this great marketplace, give me some money. What would you say to a company that's been bootstrapped um, and not really generated revenues, uh, and they bought much more than an MVP, uh, and are now trying to break in, uh, get like a seed or late seed funding to then launch the sales and marketing strategy? Uh, what would you say to to that company who wants to be invested in by a uh, late seed investor round and as a precursor to a future Series A? Yeah, I mean, I'm always a big. Fan of like, just show me the proof that's working. I don't care if it's working on a massive scale. It's not like, oh, this is working across the United States. But it's like, show me it's working at all. Um, show me some proof that it's working. I don't need, again, massive amounts of data. But like, show me month over month that people are coming, signing up, staying, spending money. Or, or you know, if it's a consumer app, they might not be spending money. They might be doing some other action. But I mean, now with the advent of these distribution platforms, like there's no excuse for not being able to validate even on a small scale that your business works. Like you have Facebook, you have Google, you have all of these amazing platforms to, to get customers and test ideas. And so people that haven't even tested their ideas, I think I, I would be concerned um, because it's not for a lack of uh, it's not for lack of opportunity. It's not for a lack of tools. Um, I think it's a lack of imagination. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the really interesting conversation so far. I have maybe a little different question. Um, when you come to invest in a company or other investors in Silicon Valley, you have other... Uh, considerations other than how much money will come out of it? Like what's the impact for society or for the environment? Yes, definitely. Um, for me, I'll just talk about my own individual thesis. Um, my thesis is really around challenger brands that are distributing access to knowledge and opportunity. Um, that's a pretty wide lens. Um, but for me, I feel like startups need to challenge something. Like, if they're not challenging something, they're just going to blend into the crowd. So they need to pick a fight. And either they're picking a fight with the way in which things have been done, like the status quo, the old way, or they're picking a fight with, like, the big elephant in the room, like the old company that's, like, not innovating at all. And so I want, to, I want to look for people to have a fire in their belly to go and challenge the status quo or go and challenge that, that you know, the 10-ton the gorilla in the room. So that's, a, that's the first thing of that thesis. And the second part is is really around people that are distributing access to knowledge and opportunity. Uh, opportunity and knowledge can be, of course, there's a, a pretty wide aperture on that. Um, but I can think of new opportunities for work, new opportunities for learning. And I believe that those, as, as the world gets more and more flat and as barriers get, get removed, these are gonna be kind of the, the work opportunities in the, in the world, the population continues to grow. And so I think that the, those are really interesting investment opportunities to bring that, that new world population into a global economy. Hi, um, I would like to know, uh, what do you see as a high growth company, especially in the consumer market? And then the second question, what do you think about freemium products? 
So can you be more specific on the first question? I don't, you're saying like you just wanted a, a random example, or I don't understand the question. Um, so what do you see as a high growth company? Like, like the criteria? Is, yes. What is your your, your criteria on a high, high growth, especially in the consumer market? Yeah, so typically, um, for a B2B company to be, I'll, I'll use both examples. So like for a B2B company, um, typically they need a minimum of 10% to 20% month over month growth um, in terms of revenue growth. Um, that's of course a lot easier to do at the beginning. Um, <laughs> gets a lot harder over time. And then you wanna see similar things around user growth, um, but I would say much larger user growth. So if you're, if you're in consumer, probably 20 to, 20 to 30 percent user growth month over month. Um, the other metrics would be on the consumer side would be, and again, this depends on the type of app, but but looking at the DAU over MAU to understand the percentage of people that you sign up in a given month, what percent of those people are coming back every single day. So DAU is daily active users, MAU is monthly active users. Um, and then the last thing would be high NPS scores, NPS being net promoter score. Uh, which tells you essentially how, how likely these people are to refer other people to the, the business. Those are kind of some core metrics. There's, of course, a, little, a lot more there. And then you had a second question. What is your take on premium products? Um, yeah, I think the way that, I think that freemium can be very valuable for, a, a, to build a, a big lead generation engine. So if you look at freemium businesses, um, really what, what, what it's designed to do is build leads um, in the B2B world, right? So if you look at Slack or if you look at Hootsuite or things like that, like those are really, really powerful lead generation engines um, that essentially sell people into higher tiers. So although those businesses might be, might, let's say 90, whatever, 95% of their customers are free, the 5% is like hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's a very, very good kind of, let's say a strategy for early stage companies. And it was developed to be able to compete and challenge these bigger brands, um, early stage startups, because they didn't have big marketing departments, they didn't have, you know, uh, they didn't have all the infrastructure, they just started giving stuff away for free, and it's kind of like a hack to get people to try your products. And once people tried them, they found it was better than the incumbents. And then they started layering on, so they kind of did bottoms up growth of freemium and then layering on kind of sales motions and higher ticket prices. So I think freemium can be very valuable there. In the world of consumer, I think uh, freemium in general is probably a bad business. If you're in venture, you know, freemium can be, can be powerful, but you have to have a lot of money to be able, like a lot of venture capital to be able to support all the time that you're just losing money hand over fist. So the answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a question around culture. Um, so you spoke about if you want to be successful, you have to have a learning mindset. And so my question relates to culture. In terms of the startups that you've seen that have failed versus those that have succeeded, how much of a role has culture played, one, and then secondly, do you believe that um, culture is something that can be created within an organization purposefully? So actually directing what type of culture you'd like to evolve within your organization? Yeah, very much so. So you know, when I look at a company as an investor, there's probably like four main criteria, and then it, like, all those things I kind of drill into. But I look at market and team and timing and terms as an investor. Um, so when you look at team in the early days, it might be like, you know, the, a guy and a girl in a spare bedroom with two laptops, right? There's not that big of a team, but you're gonna look at those two people. When you're looking at a little bit later stage company, culture is a big issue, right? You wanna make sure that, the, that those people are building a culture that is learning, building a culture that is focused on challenging an incumbent. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's, very, it's very much an intentional process and something that's the early founder's responsibility to build a, the kind of culture that they want and need for that respective company. And there's not a, this is not a one-size-fits-all thing. There's many different types of cultures, and there's, um, and there's, not, there's not 
one that you, you can't just like say, I want to be like that culture and take that culture and make it your own. You have to develop your own and find out what's unique to you. The, the business is unique, the team's unique, the market's unique, the opportunity's unique, so why wouldn't the culture be unique? Great. We'll have the last two questions. My question is um, for the future of the big business, and I just wanted to know your sort of, from your perspective, where does it make sense for startup to make a future for the big business? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give my disclaimer first, and this disclaimer applies to all my answers. Um, this is not financial advice, this is not legal advice. <laughs> This is, this is not business advice because I, I don't know your business at all. Um, and I'm just giving you ideas that I have. So you know your business way better than I do. And you should do what you believe is right for your business. Uh, because at the end of the day, if it goes well or doesn't go well, I have no vested interest in that. So, <laughs> so in terms of the question around when to partner with big businesses, it, this is a really common one for early startups, and it's understandable, right? Like you're struggling and toiling as this like small little entity, and you're like, is somebody going to come along and just like take this to the moon? Um, it, it, it is very exciting to think about that. Um, my experience has been quite the opposite, um, and that. What you have to be careful of as an early stage founder is those businesses can crush you. And what I mean by that is that they, these businesses move very differently than startups. They make decisions by committees. They take six months to implement something and, and, and in one day they can change their mind and you have no, you don't even know how it happened, you don't know why it happened, and there's nothing you can do to turn it around. So, the decision-making process and the culture of big companies are very, very different than small companies. And that's why it's oftentimes very, very hard for early stage startups to like sell into the enterprise, because they don't even know how these people buy stuff. <laughs> and so my, my answer there is just be very, very cautious. It's, I'm not going to say it's not a good idea. There are companies, of course, that have partnered with big companies and been very successful. Um, there are also you know, a, a road littered with startups that thought that that was going to make their business, and, and, and in fact, it just kind of dragged out the process. So I would just say be very, very cautious of it. Um, don't get, uh, you know, pulled into the spell of the big company potion that they put in your ears. Great. Last, okay. Last two questions, and then we'll go to the question. Yeah, um, so in short, when is it right to scale? Is it always right to scale? I'm talking about amount of amount of growth. It seems like a bit of an abstract thing to me because it seems like it should be scaling all the time. Yeah, it's a great question. This is a really common one, and, and frankly, one that I had to personally like learn a few times. <laughs> and sometimes continue to learn. So I'll, I'll t just talk about a framework that I've used and developed over the years that was helpful to me, and hopefully it's helpful to you as well. So I think one of the hardest things as a startup is, is um, knowing where you're at in the life cycle. Like, when is it time to do this? When is it time to do that? And so oftentimes what happens is because you don't know where you're at, you, like, you read some article or you talk to someone, you just like do what they tell you to do. And so you, oftentimes you'll, you'll do the, maybe the right thing in the long run, but do it at the wrong time. Um, so you'll do it too early, and you kind of don't get the impact of it. So, so the framework that I use I find in investing in companies and starting companies, I found that they, they all go through these like four very defined phases. Um, and the first phase being incubation. It's like when you have an idea, and you're just trying to shape something out of clay. You're just trying to see if there's a there there. Like, um, is this an, is this is an idea? You're just getting out there and socializing it. You're talking to people, seeing what the response is. There's not a lot of data, right? Like it's mostly qualitative. You're just chatting with people, seeing what the response has been, um, and and then like once you get through that that first stage of incubation, you find that there's a there there. That's like a consistent enough problem. And a, and a solution that you think you can provide, right? So you found a customer type, you found a problem, and you found a solution. Like that's the, you haven't just found a solution and you're looking for a problem. Does that make sense? Like first find the problem and find the customer. So that's the incubation phase, right? And that can take like three months to forever. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, and, then, and then you exit that, that phase and you enter into the validation phase. And that's kind of step two. And the validation phase is like, okay, we have these ideas, we've got this stuff written down, we've done some interviews, we've kind of like found, you know, found a, a good center point here. And the validation phase is like, okay, can we go and get, if, if it's in a business environment, can we go and get 10 customers, right? Five, 10 customers. Um, you know, in consumer space, it might be a few hundred users or something like that. Pretty small scale stuff. Still a really small team, not a huge budget. Like you're just, you're optimizing for flexibility and speed. Um, and that process can take three months to never. Um, and sometimes you go back to incubation, right? Uh, or you go forward into like what I call the upshift phase. And the upshift phase is, is defined by finding predictability and repeatability in the model. It's not defined as scale. So it, what it means is that if you've gotten 10 customers, like you want to know how do you actually have a repeatable system for going from 10 to 50 or from 10 to 80, right? And can you do that in a repeatable, predictable way? So there's a lot of experiments in that phase as well where you're kind of learning about, let's call it your playbook, right? And that playbook can be for consumer or for business. It's really transferable. The mistake that so many founders make, and I've made this time and time again, uh, is that there's this, there's this kind of gravitational pull towards scaling, right? It's like what everyone reads about in TechCrunch, and like you, you read all these blog articles about how we scaled our business, et cetera. And so people confuse validation for being ready to scale. And that's a really big mistake. 80% of reasons startups fail is actually this premature scaling, meaning that they should have either gone back to, the, to validate more or gone back to the incubation phase or, or taken their time to go through that upshift phase to really get the model and get the playbook right. And then once you get the playbook right, then you just like add more water. Then you're in the scale phase. Um, where you know exactly how to get a customer, you know how to go and get a thousand more customers, and you just need money and people and resources. And so it's important to know where you are in that cycle. Because if you do something to scale the business and you're still in the validation phase, it's like shifting into third gear at four miles an hour. Like you're just not going to get the benefit. And so that's one of the hardest things about being an entrepreneur is that you kind of don't know where you are. And so I, I found that those four stages are a really helpful question for entrepreneurs to ask themselves, saying, where, where are we really? Like, <laughs> and don't confuse yourself. Most, most of the times, you're still at the validation phase. And that's OK. Um, but treat it as, a, as, a, as an important stage and give it the love and the attention that it deserves. And don't get distracted with the next stage, because you're not there yet. Hi, uh, there's a quick question. Must being around the top one percent of successful companies? What do you think is being the most influential factor that's managing success? Hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I wish I actually really knew the answer to that one. Uh, there's a lot of there's always conversations in Silicon Valley, and hindsight's 2020. Um, where people are like, they pretend as though they actually knew that Uber was going to be big. When like in the beginning it was it was a black car service for white guys in San Francisco like that sounds like a terrible business right and so so the reality the simple reality of like true venture scale businesses is that they're not obvious um, and in many times they look stupid or crazy in the beginning and 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 so the way that venture capital works is like you make a lot of bets. <laughs> and you and there's venture math that says if you're really really good like really good at the early stages you're gonna have like one or two percent of those businesses become billion dollar companies that means there's 98 to 99 percent of them that you you thought at that time that they were just as good right like you, you actually you you made that bet in the same way that you made the other one and and so it's really easy for people to go back in the, in the time machine and say that they knew, but that has a lot of cognitive bias and it leaves out all the ones that you thought were going to be great and like hit a wall. So I, I think that that's the challenging part of being an investor. The challenging part of being an entrepreneur is that you actually, you don't have 100 companies. You have one. And so make sure that it's something that you really love and that you want to spend your time and energy and, and 
blood, sweat, and tears on. Because if it's not, like, find something else that you really love and are passionate about. Like, life is, life is too short to just be working on a business that most likely, the odds are these businesses will fail. And the odds are, like, it's going to take a lot longer than you think. And the odds are that, like, you're not going to make as much money as you think. So work on something that you really love and that you believe in. Um, that's really, like, my job, right? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. This has been, like, super insightful. Um, my last question to you is, if we're just to ask, like, what if we were planning for 2019? What would be some of the steps, like, if I wanted to just scale one metric, what would be, like, you could go a little deeper into technical detail of one method that somebody can use, like, okay, I want to grow this. Hmm. I mean, I, I think referral rates, like, that's actually the, the thing that will drive a business the fastest is how many of your customers are going to refer other customers. And, and that's a proxy for saying how happy your customers are with your service and how many people they want to tell about it. The greater that that number is, the faster your business will grow. So, and you, you talked a little bit about this, the challenge of transportation of getting people here. I, I think it's awesome what you guys are doing, and I just want to let you know, like, I, I'd love to support it. Um, happy to, to contribute 7,000 Rand to, for a transportation fund uh, to help get people here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Really, that means a lot. It makes a big difference in what we're doing. Yep. And again, I guess it's all year we've been working, working hard. You get people helping us, and right at the end, it's like, boom. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming to Startup Grand today. A big hand for the game. Please.